Welcome to the Angels Off Day podcast, the podcast coming out every off day that the Angels have. My name is Dylan. I will be your host. And the purpose of this podcast is just to try and bring joy back into following the Angels. I know it's been hard to find that recently the last couple seasons and uh, even opening night proved that it's sometimes hard to find something positive about the Angels when they feels like you're always getting buttercups. But My hope of this podcast is that you can build joy and excitement around following the Angels this season through what we're able to kind of present to you through the lens of former Angels and just fun stats and things like that. The way that each episode is going to work, uh, we'll start the episode out recapping the games that we've missed since the last episode. So obviously today we only have one game to talk about, and that's opening night. Uh, After that, there will be an interview with a former member of the organization, Uh, Today, we have Shane Lukes, who pitched with the Angels from 2008 to 2009. Uh, Just shed an insight on the Angels and how they operated uh, during some successful times in their periods. There's also uh, just some baseball-adjacent people that can just teach us some fun things about the game that we love. Uh, And then we'll end each episode previewing the upcoming matchups. I'm going to pull some fun stats that I think are going to help us set our expectations well for the upcoming matchups. Spoiler alert, Tuesday is not going to be fun for us, I don't think. But we'll get to that. But first, let's talk about opening night. Uh, There were definitely some things to be positive and be encouraged about. Uh, Mike got on base uh, and then hit three balls 100 miles an hour just right at people. Uh, Shohei got on base, obviously. got a knock uh, that probably would have been an out with the shift. uh, And obviously looked amazing on the mound. Uh, Drury made a nice play at first. Uh, Renjifo had a great at bat at the end of the game. Gio Rochella had, you know, two hits. My biggest concern is twofold. There's two things that I'm... Uh, just a tiny bit concerned about from this game. Obviously, don't want to overreact to one game, uh, but it is a bummer to kind of feel the same way that you've been feeling and have the Angels evoke those same feelings of uh, just not being a good baseball team, quite frankly, uh, even after they've reloaded and the offseason moves they've made. Uh, those two things are, one, you cannot leave 15 guys on base against the Oakland Athletics. I don't care what time of year it is. I don't care if it's just for one game. Good teams don't do that against bad teams like the A's. So that's one level of concern that I have. They put Ren, the the Wrens, uh, th- four, five, six, uh, whatever nickname you want to call them. I'm kind of down for the Knights of Wren right now because it was just one game. But uh, just like the Knights of Wren in Star Wars, they were there to look cool and not do much else. Uh, so that was the offense. Can't leave 15 guys on base. It's pretty much as simple as that, and this loss is mostly on the offense. Obviously, as far as the bullpen goes, that's the other thing. Hergett came in, did his job. It was Lupin Tapera that struggled a little bit. Tapera owned up to it in a tweet from Sam Blum. He talks about how he was pitching scared. Uh, he used some explosives that I don't think I can repeat on this podcast, but uh, obviously they came in. They didn't pitch well. I don't think either of them looked very good in spring, and I don't, in my opinion, I don't think that they earned that eighth inning, seventh, eighth inning spot based on their performance in spring training and last season. But, you know, I'm not in the clubhouse. I don't have the data. Uh, I don't think their profile fits the situations that they were in. I don't think Tony Kemp and Seth Brown are big, heavy-hitting lefties that you, you know, are super scared of and that you need to have that soft contact lefty kind of guy in there. Um, curious to why they didn't use Quijada or Matt Moore if they really wanted a lefty in. But you know what? I don't have the data. I'm sure if Matt Moore or Quijada would have let up those runs, we'd be saying the same thing about them. I just hope that Phil and the pitching coaches can put those guys in a position to succeed going forward and get that confidence back. But it is only one game. Uh, We don't want to overreact too much to it, but it is a bummer to be let down on another opening day. I think they haven't won a road opening day game in like 10 years. Uh, So hopefully we get a better result this weekend. We'll talk about that. Uh, Our interview this week is with Shane Lukes. He pitched for the Angels in 2008 and 2009, uh, but he pitched across professional baseball for 16 seasons. Now he's the minor league pitching coordinator for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Really cool story. I asked him a lot of fun questions about the Angels and just baseball as a whole. Uh, I did ask him, since he is a minor league pitching coach, about the Buddy Carlisle Reed Detmer situation, and he was able to shed a lot of helpful light on that. So that's at the end of the interview, so stick around for that. And without further ado, here is my talk with Shane Lukes. Shane Lukes, thanks for joining me, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, before we get started, I have some warm-up questions for you. Uh, the first one is, what is your biggest hot take regarding baseball or sports or just anything like that in general? Uh, I think baseball 
right now, the fact that it might be kind of trending back to more of an older school thought process. I mean, all the coaches the last couple of years have been have been working their butt off trying to get on board with you know analytics, technology, all this stuff, and uh, a lot of new coaches came in. Uh, to the game, which was really good for the game and um, uh, kind of changed the way coaching is. But uh, to be honest with you, some of us old school coaches or old school mindsets have caught up with the analytics and, you know, force plates and all this technology. And the reason we were hired in the first place is because of our, usually our relational skill and our knowledge of the game. So um, the last couple of, you know, years, have been different, but I think we're going to see a trend back to uh, more of the old school uh, type relationship coaches um, with a bunch of experience in the game, getting jobs back and, and, and excelling. Um, if you look at like Dusty Baker, Buck Walter, those guys like that, I mean, they're super successful, you know, and Bochi just got hired again. So um, I think we're trending back to the old school mind of, you know what, uh, I'm going to love on these players and, and, and give them all I got and they'll play for me. And then when you add in the new technology that a lot of us have learned the last, you know, 24 months, then, then I don't think there's any stopping us. Uh, I think baseball is in a really good place right now. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting this season going for sure. Yeah. I think if you look at like any of the most successful teams in baseball, but also in like, you know, sports like football too, the best teams blend the two. They don't go, it's the pendulum doesn't swing all the way one way towards analytics. They kind of, they blend it together. And I think blending it together is the kind of key to success in the modern day sports era. It, it can be tough because like we, I think we as an organization do a really, really good job of blending it. And we have some old school guys who are learning the ropes and some uh, um, new school guys who are learning how to be relational. And so um, learning what players need, but you know it's hard because you know we're we're not having the success that we would like to have, and there's a bright future. But then you know sometimes we look and see is it really working. But I think um, the blending of the two is the right way to go. You know we use analytics as a tool to help our players, along with you know our relational skills that we learn as a dad and a husband and a father and all those things in life uh, to help our players get better too. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, man. I, I agree with that hot take. Um, and then the second one is a little bit of a goofy question, but what is the worst ceremonial first pitch you've ever seen in person? Um, you know, I thought about this when you sent it over. I, I can't think of like the worst because to be honest with you, uh, I'm not out there for that or I'm not a part of it. I don't, doesn't even bother me. I can think of three off the top of my head. When I was an angel, I caught uh, Mark Sanchez first pitch. Butt fumble and Mark Sanchez, correct? At, but yes, at the yeah. time, that was pretty sweet, right? Now it's just be like, if someone caught my first pitch, be like, yeah, that guy, I know I've heard it, it's over. That was pretty cool. I remember one time when I was in A-ball in 1998 in West Michigan, which was Grand Rapids, Michigan, Mark the Bird Fidrich threw out the first pitch at one of our games. And he used my glove to warm up for like 30 minutes prior to his one pitch. And uh, he was every bit as odd as I had heard. And uh, it was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, even for minor league ball, I think guys get nervous and don't want to embarrass themselves in front of, you know, a couple thousand people. When I was in Fresno, California, Billy Crystal, the, the movie star, came to film a movie about him as a minor league um, play-by-play announcer. And okay. we filmed some scenes with him. I filmed some scenes with him for the movie, but it was part of the actual baseball game. So I was prepped and everything it was going to do, and he was going to walk out to the mound, wave to the crowd, and there was going to be this big moment, and he was going to throw the first pitch, and I caught it, and then I ran out, and I gave him a hug and presented him the ball. And we did this and I did this and I told literally everybody I knew that I was going to be in this movie with Billy Crystal. And then the movie came out and I didn't see it right away, but my sister went to the theater and was like, what the hell are you talking about? And then when I finally saw the movie, it turns out that my scene had got cut. So I'm not in, a, not in a movie with Billy Crystal, but I have pictures to prove it. And I did catch Billy Crystal's uh, first pitch 
um, in a movie that never made it to the actual Man. theater. You had you almost had both a baseball reference page and an IMDb page. You were so close. Well, <laughs> I would have liked to get a sad card. That'd been nice. I know, right? Um, cool. So why don't you just kind of walk me through uh, the beginning of your kind of baseball and sports journey, uh, kind of going all the way from little league to eventually getting drafted, and what that looked like. Yeah, we we I grew up in. Uh, um, well, I moved around a bunch when I was little, but, you know, I, I kind of started playing when I lived in Ellicott City, Maryland, um, and it was baseball and soccer, just like most kids. And then, you know, as we moved to Phoenix, um, you know, baseball kind of took a, took the lead because we could play year round there. And uh, I, I played football and I played basketball and I played golf and I, I did all those things like a lot of kids do. But, you know, it was pretty obvious that baseball was was better. So, you know, through junior high and high school. Um, I pretty much, I played a few other sports like football and golf in school, but it was baseball forward. And then, uh, I ended up getting, uh, an offer to play baseball at Arizona state university, which was a dream for me at that time. And, uh, so I signed that and looked forward to being a sun devil. Uh, but then I started getting a little more play from the pro pro side of things. So, um, in 1997, I got drafted and, um, I thought it was a good opportunity for me to kind of skip a goal on my way to a dream. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I decided to, to take the contract and go pro. And I moved to Florida when I was 17, um, and started my pro career. Um, really eye-opening. I moved into a dorm with, you know, 150 other guys as a 17 year old. So, um, really, really opened my eyes quickly on how things operated in the real world. Um, and then, you know, kind of grinded it out in the minor leagues for a while and, and had some good, good years and got a chance to get called up with the Tigers and spent a couple of years with the Tigers. And then, uh, had surgery, got hurt, bounced around a little bit, uh, played with a bunch of different organizations, um, made my way to the angels in 2008, uh, off of a, kind of a freak thing. Um, cause I didn't play in 07. Um, I was given a lesson at a facility that a friend owned in Arizona. Uh, when I got done working with this older kid, I threw some pitches off the mound to him. And the guy that walked by was like, Holy cow, did you do that again. So I threw a couple more pitches. The ball was coming out hot. Um, and he's like, why do you not play baseball anymore? And I, you know, it's circumstantial this or that. And so he's like, well, if I made a phone call, will you, will you throw for my friend who's an angel scout? And I was like, well, yeah, I guess. So made a phone call, got an opportunity to head down to the angels complex in Tempe and, uh, um, and threw a bullpen for like 50 people standing five feet away from me. Um, and it went pretty well. Uh, and so I ended up taking a physical and, and signed the contract in like November of 07 uh, and went to spring training with no promises, you know, no major league invite, just uh, just literally trying to see what happens. And um, I ended up being uh, the minor league camper of the camp. Like I threw well, everything went well. I got sent to Salt Lake City. I ended up being pitcher of the year in the PCL, uh, got called up. And then, you know, I had the some of the best times of my career with Anaheim the next two years. And then, you know, life moves on and I end up becoming an angel and, or a, a giant and uh, got an opportunity to pitch in San Francisco and win a world series during that run um, that they had. And, uh, and then a couple of years later, just decided it was time to probably move on with my life. It was getting harder physically, mentally uh, to be away from my family, to just be physical every day, 20 years of throwing and running and just kind of wore me out. So I retired and uh, became a coach and been trying to work my way up as a coach now. And I've got a pretty unique opportunity uh, with the Diamondbacks here. And so I started the second half of my career a few years ago. Yeah, man, that's really cool. I kind of want to backpedal a little bit because I, I love asking questions about like the nitty gritty of things. So going all the way back to when you got drafted, um, as far as like, I know nowadays it's kind of slot values and they kind of assign slot values to each pick. And like I had a buddy who got drafted uh, a lot lower than he wanted to. And he was a junior in college. And he said, hey, this is my number. It's way over slot. But if you give me this, I'll sign. How is that 
or how was that back then when you got drafted as compared to now? There were no slots. There were no, you literally negotiated for every dollar that you had. Um, you know, I got drafted high. So I, you have an idea of what that spot will, will take to sign you, but there's no, there's no, I mean, we had nobody. I didn't have an agent. I had my dad, you know, who we tried hard to figure it out, but we looked at the last couple of years and what the picks in front were getting and what the picks behind were getting. And then you just wait for them to contact you. They they came at me with a number. It was not a very good number in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And then, so you literally just, it's a, it's a old school negotiation process. Like, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? And you just kind of work your way back and you, I guess, meet in the middle. And then you're like, well, can I have some college money? And well, well, what about, you know, and then you just, it's a legitimate old school negotiation. And then you finally, two, two sides came to a, an agreement and the, the, the dude from the uh, Tigers flew to Phoenix and we met him at a Denny's and I signed the contract. It was very like unassuming. You think now, like, you know, I was going to go in the top first or second round. And so you think about some of these kids now and they have the thing in New York and the parties and the draft and all this like that. Like I signed my contract at a Denny's in Scottsdale. That's like awesome. It was a little, little different back then. That's awesome. And so then, you're pitching in the minor. You made it to the majors with the Tigers, right? Correct. In oh, 2002 and 2003. Nice. And so then you said, uh, got hurt, had surgery, and then we're kind of rehabbing in the minors. As a minor league pitching coach now, what are the different? Obviously, technology is a big difference, but what are the differences you see now for guys who are rehabbing from injury that aren't in the bigs and are kind of doing it on those levels in the minor leagues? What differences between what you see now and what you see now and what you went through back then are there? Uh, well, it was kind of unique because back then, you know, when I was going through rehab, I had a Tommy John before Tommy John's were really safe. Like I had it in 04 and everybody was like, oh, you're done. You have no chance. Your rehab's going to. And so my rehab was super like it, the time made it not aggressive, but the thought process was like, you know, we, this is your last shot. So we got to give it everything you can. And so the rehab part was like, you're going to get in shape. You're going to make it the best time. Uh, you're going to give yourself every opportunity that you possibly can. So we used to call the track, we used to call it the track team because like when you were in rehab, all you did was freaking run and run and run and run. And then they killed you. I mean, I mean, it was like the hardest thing ever. And then, um, you know, and, and, and now being a coach and seeing things from a different side of it, I understand why, the game and the organizations backed off on that because, you know, there's a lot of um, injuries that happen while you're pushing so hard and to get your arm healthy or whatever your rehab is. So the rehab really backed off. I mean, our guys in rehab with, with the diamondbacks aren't in rehab, but two hours a day and it's very mellow and it's, you know, very slow progress. And it's, we don't want to hurt your knee while rehabbing your elbow. So the running st like, it's just very different where, you know, when I got hurt the first time, it was like, you better work out harder than you've ever worked out in your life if you mm -hmm. want another chance. And nowadays it's like, slow down. We got time. We want to make sure you're healthy. So it, it has changed quite a bit. Yeah, that, it sounds like it's better for the players nowadays. And that's one of those positive advancements that we've made using mm -hmm. technology and stuff like that. Um, so you told that story about throwing a pen at a facility and an Angels guy was there. Is that kind of common for guys who were minor league free agents that they just kind of get randomly discovered like that? Or is your story kind of uh, a one of a kind type thing? Well, again, nowadays, you know, guys take videos of themselves and post them on social media. And then, I mean, I we have scouts that scour social media for videos of guys that pique their, their interest and then they oh. seek them out from there. So it, it's not as uncommon as it used to be back when that was taking place in 2007, like that was not a thing. And, and guys, you know, when you kind of fell off the map, you fell off the map and no one knew how you were progressing or how it was going. And so luckily I was still in the area where I was in high school. So there was some scouts still in the area that knew my name. So when the phone call was made, the guy was like, oh yeah, I remember that guy. Sure. I'll watch him. And then it kind of picked up a little steam because I had been in the big leagues already. And then, so when I went to the angels complex to throw, it was quite a, quite a group. Um, 
of people there to watch. And, you know, luckily it went well enough for them to offer me a contract. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I wanted to talk about those 2008, 2009 Angels teams because, I mean, I was younger and I had just gotten into baseball. And so the first season I followed baseball was 2007 and the Angels were good all three of those years. And so I was like, oh, this is just what being a baseball fan is like. Your team is good. Um, but then I never, I guess I never realized how good those teams were until the Hall of Fame ballot came out this year. And there's like six guys that were on those teams that are on the ballot this year. You got Napoli, Abreu, Tory Hunter, John Lackey, Jared Weaver, and Francisco Rodriguez. I what, mean, what was go that? farther back. I mean, there's Vladimir Guerrero, Garrett Anderson. Yeah. I mean, there's guys that... Those teams were incredible. I mean, Francisco Rodriguez, uh, I think one year, <clears throat> Brian Fuentes was a closer, Scott Shields, Darren Oliver, um, you know. And then the guys who, you know, were kind of no-name guys had 10-year careers like, a, you know, Joe Saunders. And, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, they're just – it's unbelievable some of the talent that was on there. Jeff Mathis, um, I, it's it's unbelievable. The, the, those teams were, were really, really good. It, Kind of disappointing that it didn't go better for us those two years. I mean, the Boston Red Sox were, you know, a thorn in our yeah. side. But, you know, it, those teams were incredible to be on. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I guess I just want to dive in a little bit more of that. So you get in spring training in 2008. Does it have that vibe about it with the team that, you know, they're great and that there's some all-timers on this team? Or was it just business as usual and that's how Sosh ran it? So here's the thing. In 2008, you know, I was a... I had taken a year off. I was out of shape, like all the things that that comes when it's not going well in this job. And uh, I got signed to a contract. I killed myself to get back in shape. I went to minor league spring training like March 7th. Um, I didn't know a soul. Uh, I just put my head down and worked. I went to Salt Lake City in AAA, didn't know a soul, put my head down and worked. And then I get the phone call that I'm going to the big leagues. When I walked into the major league clubhouse, I literally met everybody for the first time. So um, wow. that was in July. So, you know, I, I didn't know anybody. Now I was looking around the room and we have, like I said, Garrett Anderson, Vladimir Guerrero, John Lackey, Jared Weaver, Napoli. I mean, Gary Math, these huge, huge people in our world. And I met them all for the first time. I, I mean, I'm Frankie Rodriguez is a closer and I'm like, this is unbelievable. So, yeah. um, I didn't even know which way was up for a while. Um, and, and, and I, it, it was, it was a little intimidating. The only thing is that I had instant respect because I was older and I had been in the big league. So as far as like, Oh, new guy, I wasn't the, the 21 year old rookie that usually walks in the clubhouse. that doesn't know anybody. So it, it helped a lot. Um, I got put right between um, Weaver and uh, lackey and then, you know, it was, it was oh, great. Wow. I mean, it was great. It, it worked out really well, but it, it was intimidating the first couple of weeks for sure, just because I didn't know a soul. It's not like, it probably is not like you think. It was, it was tough. So yeah, you weren't the guy carrying the pink backpack to the bullpen and stuff like that because. Well, here's the thing is I was the guy carrying the pink backpack to the bullpen because oh, okay. our bullpen consisted of uh, Justin Spire, 10 years in the big leagues, Darren Oliver, like 16 years in the big leagues. You have uh, Scott Shields had like eight years in the big leagues. You had Dustin Mosley. Uh, who was had, you know, it was a first rounder with like three or four years in the big leagues. You had Frankie at the back of the bullpen. And I look around and I'm like, I'm the low man on the totem pole. So regardless of age or experience, I was the low man on the totem pole. So I absolutely carried the pink bag. That's, that's awesome. Um, who were the leaders in that clubhouse? Like, you know, I, I know that it's not always the stars that are the leaders, but who kind of set the tone in that clubhouse or even if there was a tone in that clubhouse for no, this is a winning ball club. This is how we're going about things like losing is not acceptable. Who were the guys that kind of hammered that home? Uh, Lackey. Lackey was a huge one. Um, Napoli was a big, a big one. Um, you know, those, those two guys, it takes guys that are, that are, you know, Lackey was the front of the rotation. Um, so he got that voice. Uh, Napoli was having monster years and catching every day. He got that voice. Um, you're right. Cause Vladimir Guerrero was awesome, but he wasn't outspoken. You know, Garrett Anderson had a hundred years in the big leagues at that point, but he's a quiet dude. So like 
finding those leaders really wasn't probably what the public thought, but those guys led uh, in very, very good ways. You know, Napoli took me out to dinner, you know, Lackey bought me a suit, like those kinds of things, um, the way they lead. Um, but, but it goes back to the minor league system when I signed in 2008 and went to spring training. The first day they told me, we, we would not sign you if we didn't think you can help contribute to a winning major league team. And then that's how every decision was based off of. And, you know, with all due respect to the to the Tigers of the early 2000s, like I didn't, I've never felt that because in the Tigers, we literally ended up being the worst team in American League history in 2003. And, and a lot of guys tried to survive. And, and in, in the Angels organization, it was, if you can't help us win, uh, we don't need you. And then they taught winning and winning can be taught and they did it in the minor leagues. So when you get to the major leagues with homegrown guys, they don't know any better. You know, the Weavers and the Lackeys and the Napolis, they don't know any better. They know how to win and know how to help uh, other te- other teammates win. And that's what they did. Yeah, I think that's so important as to why instilling a winning culture from the minors on up is so important because I I don't know how much you still pay attention to the Angels, but they obviously haven't been good for a long time. And it seems like the new GM, uh, Perry Manesian, is really making an emphasis on the minor leagues winning. And like they had uh, the the low A team and the double A team this season in 2022 were really the only two winning teams that they had. And every top prospect was on either of those two teams, because I think he intentionally was trying to instill winning from, you know, an early developmental stage. You have to. Yeah. And so then you you got called up in July of 2008. So were you in the clubhouse when Teixeira got there? Oh, yeah. So what's it like being in a clubhouse that already has this standard of winning and they make a big deal trade? Because that trade was my first baseball trauma because Casey Kochman was my favorite player of all time. And so that that one hurt me a little bit. But what's it like being in the clubhouse when uh, a guy like Mark Teixeira comes in? Well, I was fortunate because I was there when that happened. I was also there in 2012 when Hunter Pence came in. So, like, oh, okay. Like, those two pretty good ones I was a part of. But when when a guy like that walks in, it's it it lets everybody know that we're serious. Like, like we are serious about winning, and and we are willing to do drastic things at this moment to capitalize on what we have going. So. I mean, he's a he was a presence and, um, you know, immediately inserted in the lineup and we knew we were going to win every night. Uh, it, it, it's crazy. He, he was a little more, um, you know, reserved than Hunter Pence was, obviously famously given his speeches in the dugout and stuff. But like it just changes the attitude of everybody. I mean, you go from a really good team to like a scary team and, and, and everybody across the field takes notice as well. Well, yeah, I just I assume someone like to share it just his essence in the clubhouse you're like oh this guy this is an all-star you know this guy's gonna get his 10 years he's gonna get the big contract Mm -hmm. i'm sure it it really boosts that so were you you were so the red sox got us in 2008 again uh but then we beat the red sox in 2009 were you on that playoff roster or just kind of around in the dugout for that run so, you know, the, uh, and not everybody may know but they have what's called the taxi squad in the playoffs which is you know, an extra pitcher or two, um, an extra position player or two, and they, they kind of just like hang out. And, and, and if somebody gets hurt or if uh, something happens, that those guys can be inserted uh, instantly. So right below those guys are guys that have to go back to the facility and train on the taxi squad. So I was not on the travel roster. I was at the facility uh, with a buddy of mine, uh, named Jason Bulger, uh, who was a relief pitcher. Um, And our job was to go to the complex every day and make sure we were ready in case they called. Um, So unfortunately, I didn't get to make the trips because of that's how it worked. Okay. And when you say complex, you mean Anaheim, right? Not Tempe? Uh, It started in Anaheim during the home stuff. And then when they went on the road, we went to Tempe. Oh, okay cool cool yeah yeah i that that yankee series was another one of my first ever sports heartbreaks <laughs> but but um it's okay it's okay uh so yeah you pitch on these really successful teams with the angels and i'm sure you learn a lot and then you end up with the giants you were there in what years were you with the giants 
I was I was with the organization from 11 through 14, but I only spent 2012 in the big leagues. So again, winning culture then, because they went, they did the, the three in six years. What were some of the differences between kind of the, the winning culture that the Giants had set and the winning culture that the Angels had set? Um, the, the, the Angels were a little more hands-on. Like they had older players, uh, but were still being coached. Um, Socia was very loud, outspoken. Um, you know, our, our hitting co- coach, Mickey Hatcher, uh, Mike Butcher, those, they, they had a little bit more of a presence in the clubhouse and um, with the older crowd. Fast forward to 2012, the Giants, we had a younger group, but less presence from the staff. They let they let us handle our own business. They let us uh, play a little bit more. Now, both are right. Both things work very well mm-hmm. if executed. And, you know, Sosha executed his and Bochi executed his. Uh, they were a little different, but it was more player led in um, 2012, um, a little more. Um, cohesive unit uh, with mediocre talent as opposed to the angels was a little more separated, but with elite talent. And that's just because of the age of the players at the time. Yeah. Cause you were, so 2012 would be like Lincecum, right? Oh yeah. So Zito, Lincecum, um, Kane. um, Posey was just coming up, right? Posey was just coming up. Bumgarner was there. Crawford was there. Belt was there. I mean, you know, um, Vogelsong, Brian Wilson, Sergio Romo, Jeremy Athol. I mean, they're really good players, but they were yeah. they were just hitting their stride, um, you know, with a few pieces sprinkled in. Like, you know, we got uh, Marco Scudero and Pence at the at the trade deadline that mm-hmm. pushed us over the edge. But um, it was more of a team, like more – of a team than the angels was, but like I said, the angels had some, uh, some serious veteran presence there that helped. i kind of want to transition into you being a coach. Uh, you, I believe, I think I read an article cause I did a little bit of research, how you were with the giants in the minors and a coach said, Hey, you'd be a pretty good coach. What did, how did that kind of go down? I remember being in the dugout in Fresno and I had a coach, the manager named Steve Decker, and I came out early for some reason. It was just sitting there. I wasn't pitching and watching, I don't know, the crowd come in, the music play. And he was out there and he just looked at me and was like, you're going to be a lifer. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And he's like, it means you're going to make a good coach and you're going to coach one day because you just love the game. Like most guys wouldn't be out here when they didn't have to be. And I kind of, yeah, whatever. And I kind of blew it off. But, you know, he's right. He's right. I feel – um I didn't know if I always wanted to be a coach, but the closer it got to the end of my career, I was asked to be a mentor to some younger players while playing. I was asked to handle some things in the dugout, uh, in the clubhouse that were, you know, tough and, and, you know, usually reserved for veteran older players with a ton of experience. And all of a sudden I looked around, that was me. Um, so I was asked to do a lot of things um, towards the end of my career that, that were kind of paving the way. And, you know, I, I got done playing and I took a year off and, uh, you know, got the opportunity to coach with the Diamondbacks. And I, to be honest with you, I, I, I really like playing. I like, uh, there's a lot of things I miss about playing, but I feel, I feel like I'm right where I need to be in my life being a coach and trying to mentor men and build men. Yeah, man. I that was kind of the next question is what are some things that you love about being a, a coach? Um, like when you're a player, like you, you have your, your buddies and your boys and your teammates and you go eat together and you go golf together and you, you go to battle together and you do all this stuff, but somewhere in there, you're still like, I hope that it's me and not him. And and it doesn't matter how good a friend you are. That's the nature of the beast. Like, I hope that they pick me and I hope that they don't pick him. Uh, where as a coach, you, you, you know, you dive head first into these players' lives um, you get to know their parents, their girlfriends, you get to know their, their hobbies, you golf with them, you eat with them, you have coffee, you, you, you spend time in the dugout, you spend time in the clubhouse, uh, you work out together. And, and, and there's none of that, like, 
I mean, the, you, you can get past that little edge that being a, a in competition with a guy for sets. So um, it just it's just a privilege to be able to like these kids let me in their lives and then uh, to to literally kill myself to do whatever I can to make them this much better. Like some of these guys aren't going to pitch in the big leagues. I know that, but if I can get a kid who kind of maxed out a double A to get some triple A time, or if a kid that was a was a free agent signed to fill a roster at A ball. If I can get him have a good year in Double A, like that's a win. And, and along the way, we can make men right. Like we can make better husbands, fathers, uh, sons, brothers. Like, um, and and they can you know learn something from me the outside of the game or how to how to re- you know respect your wife, uh, how to treat your your girlfriend or what it looks like to be a stand up member of your community, like then, then I win. Like it, they don't have to be the best baseball player in the world. If I can help make better men along the way, then, then hopefully we all win. Yeah. And how much does your, does your faith kind of inform that approach that you take to, to mentoring these guys? Well, I had a good example. Like the guy who got me my interview um, was a a guy named Brian Hommel, which is a guy who's the chaplain for the Arizona Diamondbacks. He's with a group called Unlimited Potential. And, uh, you know, I met him when I was a visiting uh, player coming into Arizona, going to chapel services on Sundays. And we just never, never stopped talking. And and I met some incredible people through there. And, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty lucky to have some people in my life um, that have helped me in my job, which is a really tough place to have faith is the baseball field and baseball clubhouse. Um it's gotten better, but like, it's still really tough because the game just requires you to be pretty cutthroat sometimes. And you got to do some things that you sometimes you probably shouldn't do just to try to get a foot ahead. So, uh, I had, um, Mike Bell who had passed away, um, was a huge person in my life. Um, who was very vulnerable with, with a lot of people about how he was exploring his faith while trying to be in the game. I had people like Dan Carlson, who's a major league pitching coach with the uh, Diamondbacks now show me exactly what it looked like to be a leader with faith in the game. Um, and then I had a buddy, Jeff Bajanero, who's a coach with the Diamondbacks now, who, you know, held me accountable for things. I was always there when I needed it. And and it it's gotten easier for me to open up because, you know, you have to walk that line between, you know, this is where I'm coming from. And then and knowing that you're probably going to turn some people off on some level. And, uh, and that's okay because, you know, I know I'm right where I need to be in my life because God has me there for a reason. Now, my job is not necessarily to find that reason. My job is to give everything I got to that moment and, and let it work itself out. So, like I said, if I can love on these players and show them an example of what it means to be a Christian husband, father, um, how to treat people, how to stay calm in the, the toughest situations, um, you know, how to be happy for someone who had success and, and be there for someone who didn't like, if I can pass any of this stuff along um, the stuff that I've learned from my great mentors in my career, then, then it's a victory. And do you think that that's a, a common approach that a lot of uh, a lot of minor league pitching coaches have and a lot of just coaches in the minors in general have in that, like they, you know, take these guys under the wing and just love on them and be that kind of safe space for these guys being away from home, maybe for the first time, or is that, you think why you found some success being a pitching coach in the minors, because that's kind of a unique approach that you take. Uh, it's a unique approach, um, you know, and there's, there's other ways that work. I mean, there's, and you know, but I'm, I'm trying to make better baseball players, but I'm not like, that's almost secondary. Like, like it's, it's tough to say that because my job requires me to make yeah. better baseball players, but like, you know, the servant leadership approach is how I was led um, really stood out to me and that's how I want to lead. So like, you know, if it means waking up at 6am to go run with a player or waking up, um, you know, to go get a player that needs a ride or like just whatever it looks like to serve that player. If I, if I walk in the kitchen and have dinner with them and then clean his plate off the table, or if I'm just to show them that I'm, that nothing I do is above that. Like I, I'm not above it, uh, doing things like that. Um, and my God was not above doing things like that. I mean, servant leadership, how did he serve? Right. So, like I said, I had good examples, but as long as I keep in mind that, you know, that servant leadership that I was, was brought up in the game in, 
as a coach, like that's, that's how I want to coach. And if it gets me to the major leagues, then that's amazing. And that'd be great. But if it doesn't, then my job is to, is to be where my feet are at. Transitioning to how you or kind of using that as a transition, how you had all these mentors, especially at the major league level with the Arizona Diamondbacks. How much do, because I'm just curious, how much do minor league pitching coaches work with the major league staff on things? Because I, I, I believe that Brett Strom is a top five pitching coach of all time in, in major league baseball. Like they had the Astros back in the day had guys from a ball coming up and throwing seven innings in a playoff game. You know, that he's, he's a, he's a miracle worker. You know, do you get to work much with the major league staff and what, like, I'm sure you just try to glean as much as you can from that mind, but kind of, tell me, tell me a little bit what, about what that looks like. It's tough because, you know, they, we, we all have jobs that are so require so much time and effort and, and our own unique things going on. It's, it's really hard for the, you know, the a ball pitching coach to get time with the major league staff because being a major league coach requires so much. Now, that being said, we are making an effort to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, this week I'm flying to Phoenix tomorrow. This week we are getting together as a pitching department and learning from Brett Strong. Like we are doing that because, because we have a unique opportunity to learn from one of the greatest pitching minds ever, right? Ever. Yeah. So why would we not take that opportunity? I have a new role with the organization this year. And, and one of my things was, was to push this. Like we, we have to get together. We're flying everybody in from all over the world, including our Dominican coaches. And we're getting together as a small group and we're learning from Brett. So it's like, we can't not take this opportunity. Now, normally, like I said, once spring training rolls, it's really hard to get FaceTime for minor league coaches because it just, it's so, it is just, it requires so much to be a coach from, from, you know, 5.00 AM to, to after the games are over. So um, we're we're making time this year to really uh, get get in front of them and and hear what Strom has to say and hopefully we all get better. Hopefully we all keep our mouth shut and take notes. So we'll yeah, be good. That that to me sounds like a winning strategy for an organization. That's right. Um, um, this is a super specific question, but I'm just curious. You're the AAA pitching coach, correct? Uh, this year I got promoted to um, what they call a, um, one of the pitching coordinators, which is we run the minor league pitching department and we implement, oh, okay. uh, you know, policies and, and organizational beliefs. And then uh, one of my jobs is to uh, travel around the country and coach the coaches um, on how, you know, I was coached. And, and like I said, be a mentor to them now. So um, I have a little different role this year, so I'm not going to be with a specific team. Okay. So you're kind of, so that's what, uh, that reminds me of a story from this angel season that I kind of want maybe some clarification from you on. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but you know, Reed Detmer's first round pick. It's like, this guy's going to be good in the bigs. Right. He was, str he was struggling a little bit this season. Um, gets sent down to the minors and the angels roving kind of minor league pitching coordinator, buddy Carlisle. He, in the first session, discovered what was wrong with Reed's slider, and they fixed it. He came back up and looked great in the bigs, and everyone said, how does the pitching coach in the major leagues miss that, but the minor league guy catches it right away? Um, is that, how, how could that happen? It, like, it, I'm trying to phrase, I don't want like anybody to get trashed on, but is that kind of more of a common thing than maybe the casual fan would realize? Well, let me, so how that, you know, it, it's so hard to, to manage, you know, 17 or 18 arms at once because you manage 17 or 18 arms, which is, you know, also 17 or 18 personalities. And each one requires a certain amount of attention and, and a certain, um, you know, a bit of your time, but, you know, you have assistance, but you're also, you know, so close to the situation that sometimes, you know, you can't see the forest on the count of the trees type scenario. So, yeah. so when you have a guy, which sounds similar to what I'm going to be doing this year, who can, um, is not quite as involved and, and then he can hone in on one guy for a certain amount of time and give one guy his focus and attention. A lot of times things are, 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 are seen or, or noticed that, you know, if, if you stare at the same video for, 
you know, five hours a day for a week, you lose sight of what's actually being done. Where if a new guy sees the video, he might see something right away. So all they're doing is using all their resources for their players, which is what good organizations do, what good yeah. teams should do is use every resource. And so I don't care, um, you know, if he's a major league guy or an A ball guy, if we have an issue and it's not working, we should, you know, ask everybody, ask the medical department, ask the strength conditioning department, ask the, the, the pitching coordinators, ask the assistant, ask the bullpen catcher, ask his teammates. Like we owe it to the players to like involve as many people as possible to help. So um, when you have a team, an organization, like I believe the Diamondbacks are where there's no egos and it doesn't matter who gets the credit, um, which it sounds like the angels are on that way. I mean, if first of all, taking a major league guy and allowing minor league uh, coaches to touch that player or be a part of that player, it shows that there's no egos um, and nobody's trying to get credit. That's how you get the most success out of guys. And clearly it worked. Yeah. And I guess that was why I kind of teed that question up. Cause at first I was like, the pitching coach doesn't see this. Why does he have a job? But then, you know, you, you think about there's 17 or 18 guys that you got to look at. Mm-hmm. I see it as actually an encouragement that the angels have the player development staff to be able to notice those things. Cause I, I think, you know, 10, five to 10 years ago, if a guy can't cut in the big leagues, they, they weren't paying for anybody in the minors to be able to look at him. So I more see it as an encouragement than I do an indictment on any one particular staff member. You also have coaches with different skill sets. Like, you know, you have a guy who could be super good at the relationship part, a guy super good at the analytics part, a guy super good at reading the kind of tracks and force plates readings, a guy super good with rap soda, like, but, but you use all those to try to attack the player and give them the best. So, you know, I don't know the angels pitching coach very well, but like, you know, maybe he's not a super mechanical guy or maybe he's not a pitch grip guy or whatever. So they just move it down the line and let everybody take a look, you know, and you get in front of somebody who, who maybe is more specific or more specialized and, and it was able to change the kids, uh, the kids year around. Yeah, it seems to me like the key, one of the biggest keys to a, a successful organization is putting up the money to pay for minor league staff and just the different looks that you can get and giving guys as many looks as they can. Cause I mean, there's been articles written. The angels kind of cheaped out on that and let a lot of guys go. And so now they've been rebuilding it. And I think we've been seeing the fruit from that. Um, I think I have two more questions for you. Two more questions. Um, so obviously you've been an a ball, you've been kind of around the, the, the minor league levels as a coach. I guess this is a two part question. One, do you guys as coaches keep top prospects in the, in kind of the, the, on your forefront, both as guys on your team and guys you're playing, like if you're playing, you know, let's say you're playing the angels, you know, a ball team and they have the three and five prospects on their shortstop second baseman. Is that something that you guys kind of keep in mind or are you like the, the baseball America guys don't know talent like we do. We're just going to approach them like we'd approach any other hitter. Well, I mean, baseball America is is really good at identifying like tools, mm-hmm. like, but, but that doesn't necessarily make the guy a good player. I mean, we we absolutely um, sometimes I don't want to say absolutely. Sometimes we have no idea who the kids are. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, that guy hit a, you know, has a pretty good swing. Oh yeah, he's their top five prospect. Oh, I had no idea. Other times there's like, hey, they they got a couple prospects. Um, you know, but during our, during our pre series scouting stuff, which lasts weeks, like we usually identify the guys that are, that we need to be careful for. And and we, we usually can identify the guys who, you know, our prospects based on, you know, watching video and be like, wow, that guy is hitting, you know, 180, but look at his swing and he hit a homer with a bunch of power and he, he can run. And like, it clearly the kid's a really good player. He just hadn't figured it quite out yet. So it's, it's not the prospect stuff, no disrespect to baseball America, but the only people that pay attention to those prospect stuff are usually the players themselves. Yeah. And the fans, I think uh, the fans. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Care. I meant inside of our game. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah Cause I, this is going to sound silly, but I went to the first Padre spring training game this season, right after the lockout. Uh, it was Padres Mariners. 
And it kind of changed the way that I view MLB talent. And I know it's just a spring training game, but I, just the way that the balls came off of some of those guys' bats and the ball, the way the balls came out of their hand when they were pitching, you know, it's spring training. So after the fifth inning, it's mostly minor league guys playing. And a guy came in for the pods and the zip on his fastball is like, that's a major league fastball. Like that doesn't look like any of the other fastballs we've seen today. And he ended he was a minor league free agent. It was Preston Wilson. I ended up breaking camp and playing in the bigs the most of the season. And then Julio Rodriguez, you know, this 20 year old kid who's supposed to be a top prospect hit a ball. I feel like it went 500 feet. It was a bomb. And I was like, Oh, that's why he like, there's, there's certain guys that just have major league looks to him from what I've as a fan, from what I've been able to tell. Is that, spent, is that something uh, that you would agree with? Yeah. I got to coach in the Arizona fall league this year, which was uh, super unique because, you know, Everybody was a prospect, you know, everybody mm -hmm. had tools and it was really, really interesting to, to watch these guys try to come into their own. And, you know, you have guys with elite speed and you see them run and you're like, holy cow, that's what elite speed looks like. And you see a guy, mm -hmm. who, you know, has an elite fastball and then you're like, OK, that's what an elite fastball is supposed to look like. And same with the power, you know, or this guy's got an elite arm uh, from the outfield or, you know, like we had Mason win and I had heard rumors about this kid throwing 102 miles an hour across the infield during the Futures yeah, game. But and then I see him out there and I'm like, that, that's elite. Like it was really cool to be part of those, uh, those guys that had all those prospects. Um, uh, because like I said, unfortunately during the year, I just don't have time to worry about who's a prospect and who's not. So it was yeah. kind of fun to be around them all. Uh, quick question in the fall league. Did you get to coach any angels guys? Uh, they were not on our team though. No. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought, I thought I would ask, <laughs> uh, I like, there's a guy who played in the fall league. His name's Bryce Tedioso. Not a top prospect, anything like that. But man, I think he's I think he's gonna be a big leaguer. Just the way he plays outfield and I I think he has what it takes to to at least crack the big leagues. But that's just my opinion. But on your opinion, and you don't I don't know if this is like a, a breach of contract or anything, but is there any Angels prospect that you've seen over the last couple of years as a minor league coach? Maybe not one of the top prospects. Uh, but that you're like, that guy's going to be in the bigs. Well, I haven't coached against the Angels team since 2019. Okay. Um, so I, I have no idea what's going on in their system. I do know that they have uh, Preston Palmero, I believe, with and double the, A, uh, double A team. Now, I don't know really how good he is, but I have met him once because I played with his brother, Patrick Palmero, mm -hmm. and his dad took me deep a couple times in the big league. So <laughs> anybody with the last name Palmero that's part of that family, I think is uh, probably someone you should watch out for. Okay. All right. That's, that's something good to keep on the radar. But there uh, you go. yeah, man. Well, Shane, thanks so much, man. I, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. We put in 50 minutes. Look at that. That's good. Cool. Um, that's right um best of luck hopefully you guys uh i like i like a lot of the movies you guys made quick just random another random question just as a baseball fan is corbin carroll as fast as he seems in real life so let me tell you corbin carroll is as fast as he seems and i think during his first game in the big leagues last year during his debut he recorded either the first or second fastest time to home to second in all of baseball right it was so, something like that, yeah. Okay, it was like okay. this guy came in and it's just the best already. Okay, so the pitcher that we just brought up, Dre Jameson, faster. Really? Like in a foot race at the complex, Dre, who thinks he can jump over the moon, says, yeah, you're pretty quick, but I'm faster. And they lined up and Dre beat him. Dre is one of the most freakish athletes I've ever seen in my wow. life. Wow. So there's a lot to be excited for. That's usually the case with pitchers, right? Like one of my friends uh, committed to USD and played there for a little bit. He's in the Reds organization now, but uh, he he ran the fastest sixty on the whole team, and he oh, was yeah. a, he was a starter. It some of the it is just the athleticism by you know we got a bad rap for years, and it used to be you know like no offense to David Wells, but that's kind of how everybody used to think about pitchers was like oh yeah. you you drink beer and you hang out and you just throw a ball, but like. The pitchers that I've had a pleasure to work with have been some of the best athletes I've ever seen as far as 
hand-eye coordination and you know can throw a football a mile hit a golf ball 350 yards dunk a basketball jump over the moon like run i mean it, these athletes are freak freakishly good yeah and then there's shohei otani who's just in another another there you go. There yeah you go. so all right well shane thanks so much man i really appreciate it best of luck in spring this year and just kind of getting to i'm excited that you get to work with the entire minor league organization for the diamondbacks um and just kind of uh instill that that culture and that that approach that you have with those guys so thanks so much man and i uh i really appreciate it of course thanks for thanks for uh, taking the time i don't know about you but if uh the angels current pitching coach situation doesn't work out i would love for them to hire uh mr shane lukes what a fun interview uh lots of encouraging things to get out of that i especially took encouragement from him explaining the Reed Detmers Buddy Carlisle thing and knowing that it's actually a good thing that the Angels have the player development to be able to devote things like that and uh, just get guys taken care of. And I think we saw it with Reed this spring and him, you know, touching 98 and things like that. All right, let's dig in to the previews. I've done some research on this. I've got some stats that I'm excited to share with you guys. We'll just go game by game. Uh, on Saturday at one o'clock, uh, we're back at Oakland. Uh, it's going to be Patrick Sandoval versus Shintaro Fujinami. Uh, we'll start with Sandy first. Uh, in his career, or sorry, last season against Oakland, he had four starts. He won two of them, and he pitched to a 1-8-0 ERA, striking out 21 in 25 innings pitched. As far as guys facing him, uh, not a whole lot of looks from them. Nick Allen is 5-4 for four against him in his career. Uh, Ramon Laureano, 3-11. for 11. Uh, no one on the A's has hit a home run against him, but other than that, just a couple of A-Bs each. As far as Fujinami goes, uh, he's making his major league debut, uh, coming over from Japan. Uh, in spring training, he had a 3.85 ERA in five games. Last season in Japan, he had a 2.77 ERA. Uh, everyone knows he has a great fastball. His problem, even in Japan, has been control. Uh, this is an excerpt from Fangraphs. I'll link the whole article in the show notes just because it's really in depth but this is just a, a a paragraph taken from that i'll read it to you it says while fujinami's control has been up and down oftentimes leading to disastrous performances his raw stuff is excellent he's always been a hard thrower especially by npb standards but he hit a career high last season averaging 96.3 miles per hour and occasionally reaching back for triple digits the only npp starters who threw harder were fellow mlb newcomer kodai senga and 21-year-old phenom Roki Sasaki. Fujinami fires from a low vertical release point, allowing the pitch to play up beyond its shape due to its flat vertical approach angle. His fastball has a hybrid shape with far more horizontal break than most four-seam fastballs and more vertical carry than the average sinker. According to the source data, few MLB fastballs compared to Fujinami's in terms of movement and release point. Similar heaters include those of Nathan Eovaldi and Aaron Nola. So, very good fastball they're going to face. Controls the issue. Uh, I think this game just comes down to how patient the Angels hitters can be. Uh, with a righty on the mound, maybe this is a game to get Jake Lamb in. Uh, maybe Matt Theis gets some time in there. Uh, I doubt Brett Phillips plays, but uh, might be a good game to get Jake Lamb some time in. Maybe move Drury over to second. Uh, but I think Patrick Sandoval's faced the A's. Uh, he pitches well against the A's. This game's going to come down to the Angels' offense against Fujinami. All right, for Sunday, it's going to be Ken Waldachuk versus Tyler Anderson. Let's look at Tyler Anderson first. Uh, no one on the A's has faced him a whole lot, with the exception of Jesus Aguilar, who's two for 11 against him, so that's good. Uh, Tony Kemp's one for six. Lemis Diaz is one for seven. Uh, he didn't face the A's last season because he was pitching in for the Dodgers, but in 2021, he let up two runs in 11 innings, so two starts against them. I didn't even realize Tyler had a pretty good spring. He threw, he had a one three five ERA, uh, and in his tune-up start, he went two runs and five point one innings pitched. Ken Waldachuk, he was one of the main guys that came over from the Yankees in the Frankie Montas trade uh, in twenty twenty two. Up at the big league level, he pitched to a two and two record and a four nine three ERA with the best start of his career. Shocker, coming against the Angels in the last game of the season. Yes, the game that Trout hit that monstrous home run off. Wasn't off of him, but it was that same game. He went seven innings with three hits, one rock, and four Ks against the Angels. So 
Uh, they had a lot of their main guys playing. Renhifo played, Ward played, Otani played, Trout played, Ohapi and Stassi played. Uh, so it was a decent Angels lineup that he did pretty well. But he has really struggled in spring training. Uh, he's had a 10-plus ERA. He's let up 16 runs and 14.2 innings pitched, uh, walking four and giving up five runs in his tune-up start on Sunday. So uh, he's been having some issues this spring. Obviously, you take spring training stats, spring training stats, with a grain of salt, but it is something to be aware of. Uh, he faced the Angels on February 28th. Uh, he pitched an inning against them. Uh, he gave up a single to Fletch, a walk to Renhifo. Uh, Jake Lamb hit a three-run home run off of him, and Logan Ohapi hit a line. Uh, he pitched some other minor league guys too, but the guys that are on the team. Uh, so maybe this is a Jake Lamb game. Uh, he is a lefty, so I don't know, but Lamb hit a bomb off him in spring training. So uh, Tyler obviously has pitched well against the A's. Uh, we saw, you know, Loop gave up. Loop's a lefty. I don't know how well this lineup is going to face against lefties, but Waldachuk has struggled in spring. Uh, if he carries it over into this game, the Angels should be able to take the last two games of this series. We know Tyler and Patrick are going to pitch well. It all depends on the Angels' bats. As far as the Seattle series goes, uh, Monday's game, in my opinion, is going to be the biggest one. Uh, it's Reed Detmers against George Kirby, two young guys with great stuff. Uh, the Mariners haven't faced Reed a whole lot. Uh, Sam Haggerty's two for six against him. J.P. Crawford, uh, two for seven. Uh, last season, he went. He had two starts against them uh, with a one three eight ERA, two runs in 13 innings, 10 Ks. Uh, so that's great. Reed has looked great in spring, did well against them last season. Uh, George Kirby is going to be playing uh, opposite of Reed. Last season, he had a 3-3-9 ERA, a 3-3-1 expected ERA. Uh, he threw 130 innings with 133 Ks. In spring training, he had four games to a 2-3-1 ERA, 15 Ks, and 11.2 innings pitch. So he strikes a lot of guys out. Last season versus the Angels, he went 2-2 two two with a 3-0-4 ERA in four games, which doesn't sound dominant. And if you look at his uh, stats, he, in the four games, he went six innings, two runs, 5.2 for three runs, six innings for one run, and six innings for two runs. So not exactly dominant, but those are all quality starts, and it all put his team in a position to win. So uh, he's faced the Angels a lot. The Angels are familiar facing him. Uh, Shohei's 5 for 11 against him to a 455 batting average, and uh, Michael Nelson Trout is 2 for 5 with a home run against him. So... I really think that game's going to come down to those two guys. They seem to see the ball well off of him. Uh, and if Mike and Shohei can keep us going, uh, that should be a game that we can take. Luis Renjifo's one for 11 against him in his career at a 0 one ERA. So I would not be surprised if Renjifo is on the bench for that game. But I think that's a game that Reed can play. Uh, and I think that can take us to a three-game winning streak. Okay, I mentioned it in my intro. Tuesday is going to be rough, I think. It's Luis Castillo against Jose Suarez. Uh, in his last season against the Mariners, Jose uh, pitched in four games, started three of them, uh, and he went one and two with a 3.92 ERA. That one win was the brawl game, the Jesse Winker brawl game that he came in uh, as the second pitcher after Andrew Wentz. Just unfairly got thrown out, totally. Um, but he pitched well against them. As far as uh, Mariners batters against Jose, um, JP Crawford is eight for 20 against him at a 400 average. Uh, Ty France is five for 14. Uh, Tay Oscar is three for six. Sam Haggerty's two for four. Uh, Tom Murphy's two for four. Eugenio Suarez is two for eight. Julio is two for six. Uh, they've all faced him a lot, and this Mariners lineup is kind of built to kill lefties. Um, and Jose just isn't as dominant as Reed is, in my opinion. Uh, and they're going to be facing opposite of Luis Castillo, who has pitched to a lot of these Angels guys before, and it has not gone well. Drury's 0 for 2. Uh, Jake Lamb's 2 for 7. Rendon is 3 for 7, which is a good clip. Hunter Renfro is 2 for 15. That's good for a 133 batting average and 7 Ks against him in his career. Would not be surprised if that's the day he gets a day off. Uh, Mike's 2 for 2. Taylor Ward's 1 for 2. Um, not feeling great about this. Uh, he looked great in his first start. He went six innings of, I believe, one run ball against the, the Guardian. No, no runs. He, he Six innings, one hit, six Ks, no walks against the Guardians in his first start on Thursday night. 
Uh, not feeling great about this. I don't think this is a game that they win. I think if you watch the way that they swung the bat against the Oakland A's and a not-so-great starting pitcher, Luis Castillo is going to be the best pitcher they've faced so far this season, and I don't think it's going to go very well for them. I think their winning streak ends at three. For the last game of the Mariners series, it's going to be Shohei Otani versus Robbie Ray. Best pitching matchup of the season so far. I'm really excited to watch that one. Uh, as far as Mariners pitching, or as far as Mariners hitting, sorry, against Shohei, uh, I'm not able to get that data because ESPN won't let me uh, do splits against him. But I know that last season, uh, the Mariners went. Sorry, let me just pull it up real quick. Shohei, Shohei is a little bit more harder to navigate on ESPN as far as pulling the stats up because he does both. But last season, uh, he made three starts against the Mariners. He went 2-0 and with a 0.95 ERA, uh, two runs in 19, inning, 19 innings, 21 Ks, uh, one home run, four walks. He's Shohei Otani. He steps up. He knows this is going to be a big game. Uh, as far as Robbie Ray pitching against the Angels, uh, Brandon Drury 0 for 2 against him. Shohei Otani's 3 for 9 with a double and a triple against him. Uh, 3 for 9, but with 5 K, so it's kind of extra base hit or strikeout with him. Brett Phillips 0 for 7. Rendon is 5 for 12. Hunter Renfro, again, 3 for 33. Uh, that's good for a 0 9 1 batting average, 17 Ks and 33 at bat. So I don't think Hunter Renfro is going to have a very good couple of days. Really hope I'm wrong. Uh, Luis Renjifo is 6 for 11 with two home runs against him, though. So. Uh, Gio and Taylor are three for 10. Mike's one for seven. Uh, so Robbie Ray coming off of Cy Young a couple years ago, uh, didn't have the, the, you know, a Cy Young kind of season last season, but he still had a great season. Shohei Otani, Robbie Ray, uh, best pitching matchup of the season. I'm really excited to watch that one. Um, and yeah, I, I'm going to, because Shohei is pitching, I'm going to go out and say that I think they win that game, uh, which means that at the end of the first two series of the season, they will be, four and two i think that's a great place to end uh a a six game stretch to start the season against with three with the a's and three with the mariners mariners obviously a playoff team last year uh taking two or three from them in a series in the very beginning of the season would be huge uh so if they can end four and two maybe i'm wrong about the games they get wrong but if uh the next time we talk on thursday uh if they are four and two maybe even three and three I think I'd be happy, but there's absolutely a scenario where they uh, end this maybe one in five if the bats just don't wake up and uh, they just keep leaving guys on base and pitching well, but leaving guys on base like they did this first game. Uh, We could see each other again when the Angels are one in five and not be very happy campers. Thanks so much for listening to the first ever episode of the Angels Off Day podcast. I know it's been a long episode, but if you're still here, Thank you so much. Please leave a uh, rate and review on whatever platform you're listening to this on. You can follow me on Twitter at Angels Off Day Pod. Uh, I'm going to be posting clips in that. If you could just retweet it, uh, that would be awesome. Just trying to spread the word and spread joy uh, as far as being Angels fans. Uh, it's going to get better. And it could be worse. We could be Mariners fans. <laughs>